My name is Gail Gordillo. I'm the Chief of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery at Indiana University, and I'm also President of the Plastic Surgery Foundation. You are listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Gail Gordillo, Chief of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery at Indiana University and the current President of the Plastic Surgery Foundation. Doc, how are we doing today? Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being with us. So getting this started, you know, what were your goals and aspirations during your residency? Yeah, so during my residency, um, I had done research before. I, I'd done research as an undergraduate, and uh, I took two years off between undergraduate and medical school and did research. I did research in medical school, and I knew I wanted research to be part of my career. So I actually did four years of general surgery, went into the lab, and it was supposed to be two years. It turned into three years because I got NIH money. And uh, so it was clear to me that my aspiration was to be a surgeon scientist with a, a lab. Now, taking us through that last year, you know, what was your mentality heading into your first job search and how that perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? Yeah, so that's, uh, especially for somebody like me, when you want to have research as a big part of your career, um, there were two things that were challenging and um, important. One is I was married and I had two small children and my husband was not very portable. He had a very sort of unique job. Um, and so that was a challenge. And then when you're going to try and do something like research, it's hard to go where it's hard to have a boss who doesn't understand how research works. So if that's something that you're interested in, most important thing you can do is try and find somebody who understands that. Now, I ended up taking a job where that wasn't the case. And then the other thing that was uniquely challenging was I stayed at the institution where I trained. So, so you're always like the kid. You're never the adult at the table. You're always the kid at the table. So that's always also a challenge and you have to recognize that that's gonna be a challenge. Um, but I was fortunate to have people, while they didn't understand research, they understood that that was a big desire that I had. Um, and I could find, I had clinical mentors and research mentors. And that was how I could navigate. Because you can't do it. The biggest thing I would tell you is you really need mentors. Really, 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 hands down, most important thing is you need mentors. Or even sponsors, people that will open the door for you. And that's what I had. And that was what allowed me to get traction um, and um, sort of move forward with my career in, in a big way. So mindset should be ideally find somebody who understands what you're trying to achieve. And second of all, you need mentors because there's no way you can possibly understand all the steps and all the hoops you have to jump through without um, somebody to give you some guidance. Probably the third thing I'd say is be really focused. All Anybody who is a plastic surgeon is very capable. Um, and if you want to do something like research, um, you have to not be doing the education committee and the student interest group and that you have to be laser focused. That's the biggest thing I tell you is be very committed. People think they're going to try and do you favors. Oh, why, why, don't, why don't you uh, serve on this committee? If it's not a committee about research, it's not going to advance your career. So you can be very focused, get mentors, and um, try and find somebody that understands what you're trying to achieve. Can you briefly take us through your journey on how you ended up being the chief of plastic surgery at Indiana? Sure. So um, as I mentioned, I trained at Ohio State University and I stayed there. And um, a big reason why I stayed there was because I was married with two small children and and my, my husband, who is now my ex-husband, was not portable. Um, and that, that, I still had a great career at Ohio State, and I still achieved all the goals that I wanted to achieve. But at, at, there comes a time when, and I think everyone, women and men, but especially women, I think are less likely to pull the trigger, to understand that um, I what was important to me was I think I was making significant contributions and in some areas they were valued, but in other areas they were not. And it's very difficult to work as hard as we work and not feel valued. Um, so I started looking and um, uh, I knew 
I had offers at other places, but um, I knew it had to be the, um, and yet the timing had to be right. That's the other big thing. So the timing for me was I had my NIH grant. I got paid incredibly poorly, incredibly poorly. Like as a woman who was married, they told me point blank, you have a husband who works, we're not gonna pay you as much. I mean, it was just obscene. Finally, when I started looking and uh, the chair, the, the dean of the, the medical school asked me, why are you looking? And I said, I can't even afford to send my kids to, to college on this salary. I mean, it was bad, it was bad. And, um, but when you, when you look, you gotta mean it. You gotta be ready to pull the trigger and walk. But that is, and now the first time I looked, um, I actually, I was interviewing at Harvard and Cleveland Clinic in Michigan, and I got offers from two of the three programs. Now I didn't leave, I stayed at Ohio State, but they had to retain me. And that's how the game works. Then I got a leadership position. Then I got a pay raise. And I think particularly for a lot of women, they're not willing to go that far. Now, I, if, I, if, I, I could, if they hadn't made a good offer, I'd have left. You gotta be ready, you gotta be sincere. Don't waste anybody's time. So that was the first time around when I started looking. And then the second time when I started looking, um, my kids were off to college. Uh, I was now single. Um, and I was looking for the next level up. Um, I had had a leadership position as a medical director at my previous institution, but now I was ready to be a chief or a chair. I had renewed my R01 um, and you know, I thought I had been on study section for, I mean, study section for NIH, committee chairs at national levels. I, I, I was ready for the next step. And, and I think one of the big challenges that people think is they, the timing is really critical. So they think they're ready before they're ready. Um, you know, don't tell people you're, you're a, a bona fide research scientist, frankly, in my book, until you've had your R01. Um, that's the gold standard, that's the benchmark. And people wanna look before then. And your, that your market value is much less until you have proven credentials that you can do this. Um, and so the second time when I looked, um, I, I knew I had a much clearer vision of, I, I needed a very recognizable leadership role. Um, I wasn't, I, I was sort of, I could call the shots. I didn't have to leave. I wanted to leave, right? Because I didn't feel valued, but, um, and it, it, uh, it, and I brought 40 people with me. That's the other thing. So I brought a huge team of people. Um, and uh, because I now my lab had grown and I was uh, serious collaborative partnerships and it was four or five visits. And we'd looked at another institute, six visits, take your time, get the details right. Um, you know, if they really want you, they'll, they'll, they'll let you know. And um, I'm now, I left my previous institution after 18, no, tw yeah, uh, yeah, 18 years as a faculty member. I'm sure they thought I'd never leave, no regrets. No regrets whatsoever, very happy. Um, people look at you differently when you come from the outside too. Like I said, I stayed. That you, you're such a well-known quantity that um, they, they can take you for granted. Now on the topic of your journey, what would you say were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career as you climbed the ranks of the academic world? Yeah, the key, the key, the key is focus. Um, I think people meant well, like I said, they'd be like, why don't you serve on this committee? Or why don't you write this book chapter? And I'm like, if it's not going to really advance my career, like, and, and, and the other thing is even, uh, um, you know, I was offered to be on the track to become the PSF president at a younger age, but it wasn't through the research. It wasn't coming up through the research track. And I said, no. You have to be very clear about what you want your identity to be, and you have to stake that out very clearly. And I wanted people to say, Gail Gordillo, research, okay? I could have come up the leadership track through the other arm in the plastic surgery foundation, and I didn't want to do that. It took me away. It took my focus away. If you're trying to balance both clinical and, and certainly research, 
you don't have time for all those other service things. And that's the other big thing is you have to be a mercenary with your time. Um, and, and you can't expect your colleagues to pay for your service time. I think that's another really common mistake. Oh, well, I'm on this committee or I'm on, on that committee. And it, 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 unless you're pulling your weight in terms of what you're doing clinically, you cannot make that ask. Um, and I think that's something that people don't understand. So you have to be really selective about how you spend your time and what you want your reputation to be and really focus on just that. Now, as the chief of the program, what advice do you have for the graduating chief residents and fellows entering the professional job market for the first time? The biggest thing that I would tell them, and I think people overlook this, is I tell people plastic surgeons are like the BASF of healthcare. We don't make healthcare, we make healthcare better. So what, what surgeons need to understand when they go, even if you're in private practice, more so in, in, in private practice and more so in smaller communities, but wherever you go, you are bringing a skill set that improves the quality of life for the people in that community. Um, and and you know, you're, you're bringing them breast reconstruction or you know, lower extremity reconstruction or cancer reconstruction. You don't, you don't view yourself as a, that kind of a contributor to the community, but you, especially if you're in a smaller community, making a huge contribution to the quality of life for the people in that community. And that's what you need to recognize. And the person, if you are employed or hired, that's what they need to recognize. Um, and it, it, it doesn't mean that you're arrogant. It means that you recognize that all of us in academia, it's sort of like raising a child. We've poured all this skill and this knowledge into you. We want you to go out and utilize that and make life better for people in your community. And um, you can do that professionally. You can do that, you know, you just by virtue of that, you're a leader in that community. Now dealing with the pandemic in 2020 and out here in 2021 as well, a lot of these annual conferences were canceled. So what advice do you have for the graduating class regarding their networking and outreaching process in a virtual world? Yeah, so um, networking, our business, people in the business community know relationships make the world go round. And medicine's no different. I think physicians are not as in tune to that. Um, they should be, especially as plastic surgeons, we're a consultative service. Um, but if you're in academia, networking gets you speaking opportunities, gets you committee appointments, gets you, you know, um, maybe helps you find a job. So it's, it's, it's super important and the best way um, to network is through societies. And there's two things about societies that are beneficial. One is the networking. Two, it's you make friends and it's fun. But three is it's a way to give back. Um, and, and you can give back, like I said, I gave back through research through my society. And that was how, and you build your reputation because people who are like-minded with similar interests, they'll learn about what you do. And like I said, you can network there but you also give back to your society. We're, I feel very fortunate to be a plastic surgeon. I hope everybody else does. I mean, we have this tremendous job and this tremendous opportunity, but um, certainly as an academician who wants to pay it forward and train the next generation, service through societies is a way that you help your, your peers and make the specialty better. Network and you advance your career. So it's a win-win-win. So being the program leader, what are you looking for in candidates that say medical school candidates applying for a residency and also residents that are applying for fellowship positions? Yeah. So uh, number one thing, number one thing, hands down, integrity. Um, and, and, and you either have it at this point or you don't. Your, your parents taught it to you or they didn't. Um, uh, you know, we're not going to we're not going to teach that to you at this point. So integrity. I get if you were asked to do something to take care of a patient and you couldn't get to it. I'd much rather have you tell me, I'm sorry I didn't get it done than to lie, right? Because then, 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 then all bets are off. I don't know whether to trust you, the patient's gotten bad care, like hands down integrity. And you can't, your professional reputation is priceless, is priceless. And it starts even as an intern, you know, even as a medical student. It is priceless. And so people need to be in medicine more than anything else because we're taking care of people's health and people's lives. 
They need to be able to trust you. Um, and so hands down, like I said, medical student, pre-med, fellow, hands down, I gotta be able to trust you, right? Um, and, and I need you to be professional because if you're a medical student, resident or fellow, you're an extension of me. So when you talk to my patients, you're an extension of me or any other faculty member. And so that professionalism is super important, super important. When you get out on your own, it's, it's the only thing that you have control over. How you behave and how you act and how you present yourself is the only thing that you have control over. How people interpret it, different question. But you know how you behave and how you act, you have control over it. And so I can't, I think people don't value that enough. So being a female leader, what advice would you have for female medical students that are considering getting involved in a surgical specialty? The first thing I, I will tell you when I was a young woman, all sorts of stuff to try and discourage me. Well, why would you want to do that? You'll never get married. You'll never have children. You're such a pretty girl. Why don't you become a drug rep? I really, um, my first advice, follow your passion. Follow your passion. Because as you go through, you will have the resources to do what you need to do. You know, I mean, I don't think people think of it that way, but you will have the resources to make your life what you want it to be. Follow your passion. Don't have regrets. You know, you'll figure it out. You can't figure it out ahead of time, that much I can tell you. You have to, you have to, you have to figure it out as it comes along. Like I said, if you're in plastic surgery, even as a physician, you're smart and you will have resources and trust that you will have the resources and the brains to, to make your life work. Now, obviously you can make bad, some bad choices, but starting out of medical school, you know, you should have the ability to, to pursue your passion. I just don't, I would never compromise. I would hate to have that regret. And um, there are enough women in plastic surgery now, not, not, we're not the majority, but usually when you hit about the 30% threshold, there's enough of a critical mass that you can have some impact. And plastic surgery, I think is very, you know, the leadership is very forward thinking and very supportive. Um, uh, follow your passion. And that's the number one thing. And um, don't, 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 don't have regrets. I just think that's terrible. And, um, you know, if you have a very enlightened boss, all of those things that women deal with, pregnancy, you know, I will tell you, um, I obviously I, I ended up getting divorced, but I told my boss and he, he knew, he understood what I was going through, how challenging it was for me. I had a great boss. Um, and hopefully even, even if, you, you know, and he's male, but you, you know, if you have an enlightened boss, all of those things you can discuss with them, um, you'll get through, don't let that, don't let that deter you. Now, switching gears, can you please talk about your involvement with ASPS, the Plastic Surgery Foundation, and also what educational programs and resources are you providing for the next generation? Yeah, so um, uh, as I mentioned, um, I viewed my engagement with AS, ASPS and PSF as, as precisely those things, service to give back to my specialty, networking, and you know, a way to know what's going on in the world of plastic surgery research, which was my interest. And there are so many potential avenues to engage. There's legislation and advocacy. There's, um, there's education. Education is a big one. Um, you know, there's finance. There's, there's all sorts of ways to engage. And so hands down, that's a really great thing. And you can engage even as residents. So residents are allowed to be on committees. Um, and that's how I started. I was on committees. Um, and then I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I felt pretty passionate that I had good ideas to contribute. And obviously, they felt the same. Um, and uh, it, it just, it, it was a, it was never work. It was always something I really enjoyed. And like I said, to me, it's a really important thing to get back. One of the other things that's great is you learn firsthand, like my leadership ascended faster in my specialty society than in my academic institution. So you really get some, some good experience in terms of how to work in groups, how to work across a big organization, 
Um, th there's, there's definitely, and they have leadership training. So there are really some great opportunities by engaging in ASPS and the PSF. One of the things, so a couple things that um, I'm particularly proud of on the Plastic Surgery Foundation side, we um, give out grants and a lot of them go to residents and fellows. So I had one as a resident um, and, and um, this past year we gave out more than a million dollars in funding. So great opportunity. You know, it's a great way. When I was a resident and I got one of those, it was the first one that they ever had at Ohio State. It's a badge of, I mean, these are nationally competitive grants. So it's a big badge of validation that you're a legitimate potential scientist. And it, it just, um, so that's one of the things I'm really proud of what we do. And like I said, and as the leadership, we, I have been involved in raising money, both mostly through corporate sponsors to increase that pot to get it up to a million dollars. One of the other things that we're doing just now, which I'm thrilled about, um, the PSF is the uh, research and global outreach arm of the ASPS. So we just are started launching a new program called SHARE. And that is a mentorship program for surgeons in Africa. Um, and so uh, there are, I think 12, I mean, just starting this year, there are 12 surgeons that are, they have a junior and a senior mentor, um, but we're really, very committed to um, being a global organization and helping our global, global partners. Um, we do, I just was on a call this weekend uh, for a global alliance for breast implant registries. Um, so there are lots of opportunities in that way, again, through the PSF for global outreach. Um, uh, we have visiting professors. I was a visiting professor that was great. Actually, one of the faculty that I just hired, I met as a visiting professor so again, the networking, I mean, it's, it's really critical. And she's, oh my gosh, she's fabulous. So, um, and she's a surgeon scientist and a hand surgeon and, and she's fabulous. And I met her as a visiting professor. So um, all of those things are just, they're great. There are great opportunities for um, residents to see faculty from other institutions and, and learn what's going on. And so, so that's, that's how I got involved. And it's been a labor of love for sure. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.